The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Dhammo habe rakati dhamma chari dhamma suci no sukama bahati esa esa ni sang so dhamma suci ne na du gating gachati dhamma chari. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I think. Uh, some people will know what that verse means, you know, even if your Pali is uh, rudimentary, you can sort of get an idea. But the translation, I should first of all say it's from the Theragata, and the Theragata are the verses of the enlightened monks, and there's also the verses of the enlightened nuns, the Theragata, and both of them incredibly inspiring, especially if the translation is good. And this is some verses by a monk called Venerable Dhammika, and um, the uh, meaning of what his verses are. Truly, practicing Dhamma according to Dhamma protects the practitioner. Dhamma, when well practiced, brings happiness. Good news. This is the reward of Dhamma when well practiced. The practitioner of Dhamma does not go to a bad destination, a dugating. So that's really. And the theme for this talk is, of course, you know. Um, as you can see, you know that uh, it's about protection, protecting ourselves and others through our practice. And this is a really important aspect of the Dhamma, actually. Um, the reason that I, I give this talk, I've <laughs> given it in Sri Lanka a few times, actually, is because particularly one of the, the causes for it was the terrorist bombings in Sri Lanka in April. You probably heard of those where some uh, terrorists blew up uh, some hotels, some churches, Christian churches, and so on, and killed a couple of hundred people, 240-something, they say. And uh, the response to that was, uh, I couldn't believe it in Sri Lanka, the, the fear and insecurity was incredible. It's just tangible, actually. Uh, I, and I think a large part of it may, and anger too came up later as well, a large part of it may have come from trauma, <laughs> reliving the trauma of the war, which they'd lived with for so many years. The insecurity of not knowing whether you were going to be blown up on a bus or a train or it, what was going to happen, whether you'd come home at night. So I think that's what brought it up. But of course, it brings up, for me, you know, and I think for many people, but uh, also in the other aspect I thought of to, to make it more local, <laughs> is I came and said, when you go to any big city in the world, she'd say, what, what are the largest buildings? Do you remember? Do you remember? Banks, are, actually, that's probably, that's probably the truest. But she said, her, her answer was, insurance companies. <laughs> <laughs> They're pretty big too, aren't they? You see them everywhere. I think hospitals too are pretty big. Banks is a good one, actually. <laughs> Uh, they're in the news these days, but uh, insurance companies because we want what are insurance what's insurance about protection you know life insurance we call it I think it's very funny in a way because you talk about life insurance but you die and then you get the benefit the family gets the benefit. so whose life is it protecting not ours <laughs> it's protecting our families and that's actually a great relief for people because. If you, if you die knowing that your family will be provided for, it gives some ease, a peace of mind, some ease to the mind. So you don't, worry, you don't die worried that they won't be able to uh, live, won't be able to continue their lifestyle as they had before. So this brought up the question of how do we really protect ourselves? How do we really protect ourselves? And you know, the, uh, the common answer, <laughs> Well, what is the common answer? How do you really protect yourself? It's actually a very simple answer, this one. It's what, you, what I saw in Sri Lanka. It was more and more security. More and more, you know, uh, security personnel at banks, hospitals, um, everywhere in Colombo. There were lots of security. It, it seemed like a, a too much, too late. <laughs> That's what I thought when I saw it all. If they'd had that beforehand, it would have been good. But even here, 
you know, when I came back, I heard, uh, I was informed that we've installed a lot more CCTV. Is that right? CCTV? Because the police, you know, if there's any, um, you know, break-ins or any incidents, that's what we call them, incidents, you never know what can happen, then they like to see the footage, don't they? They like to have proof. And so you see CCTV is very widely available. It's just everywhere. And uh, even the monastery I stayed in, I couldn't believe it. I stayed the Vasa in this monastery in the mountains. When I arrived, they were installing CCTV cameras. And I thought, I, th I thought, wow, must be a lot of stealing going on or something, you know. But they had, I think, uh, BSV here, how many cameras do we have? Three or four? Seven. 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 This monastery had more than 15. They had about, I, I th they seemed to be everywhere, really expensive. I couldn't quite understand it, but then just before I left, I was talking to one of the monks and uh, come to come to Colombo and then Australia. I was asked, I said, you know, the, all the signs have been uh, removed. Uh, why, why was that? And he said, it was because of the bombings, because the worry that the monastery would be identified as a Buddhist monastery. And they have some small monks there. They have these, they call them potty harm drews in, in Sinhala. And they were very afraid for their lives. So they installed all these cameras. That's what I think they did. They installed all the cameras, put the signs down, just for security. And this is what people do for their security. More and more CCTV cameras, more and more security staff, you know, uh, uh, guarding places. But then what does the place we live in become like? Prison, it basically becomes a prison, you know. And, you, and I think a lot of these, you know, uh, VIPs must feel a bit like that, you know, the President of the United States or the Pope, you know, they have the Pope Mobile and all that sort of thing. So it's a bit like a, a prison. And really, what are we we're trying to protect? That's what I would ask, you know. What do, what do we want protection? What, what do we want protection from, actually? And the next question is, what do we want to protect? Any ideas? Mad people. Mad people, yes. I think that's... A, yes, that, that happens. But, but the basic thing we want protection from is fear and insecurity. These are mental phenomena, actually. And mainly the fear of being killed, being harmed, you know, something like that. But people also have fears of many, many things. They have fears of spirits and goats, ghosts. That's quite a big one in um, Thailand, in Sri Lanka, and somewhat, I think. Not, not, not as big, I think, in, in Thailand. It's a, it's a very uh, great fear, and you hear Ajahn Chah talk about it. But few people are actually afraid of the things that re really are more important, uh, for Buddhists anyway. And that's the ripening of bad kamma vipaka, bad, bad kamma vipaka. So you know, these, these are events. Karma brings a lot of negative, can bring a lot of positive things or negative things, depending on our actions in the past. And so this is something we should be really afraid of. <laughs> and we should be really afraid of a bad rebirth too. That's another thing if you're a Buddhist. But the bottom line, we should really be afraid of our defilements and other people's defilements. Because this is what those bombings were caused by really other people's defilements and their incredibly incredible view of the world that this is actually a positive thing to do. Isn't that amazing? To kill a lot of people, blow themselves up and kill a lot of people is thought to be a positive thing. And of course what do we want to protect is this body is one is number one, I think. But it's also our wealth and our possessions. That's a very big area. We want to uh, protect them against loss and praise. We want to get praise. These are the things we want. Reputation, power, status, and our sensual pleasures. We don't want pain. And the big things we want to, cre to protect in our life, probably number one, family and friends too. So that's, that's those areas. And if you see those things that we're wanting to protect, these are called the worldly dhammas usually. They're called the worldly dhammas, the eight worldly dhammas that turn the world around. But what most people 
Most people are going for, even Buddhists, is external protection, isn't it? It's external protection. You see it in Sri Lanka and you see it here. You know, protection by um, chanting uh, parita, chanting uh, the verses, the uh, verses, the teachings of the Buddha. And the Buddha actually said these are a protection. These are a protection. Um, but the, the greatest protection in chanting the Buddha's teachings is understanding them <laughs> to some degree. And practicing them <laughs> practicing and that's the point so it's uh, that is and also very popular is uh, in Sri Lanka not so much in Thailand is uh, the threads that they tie around the uh, wrist which have been you know chanted over they are many people think they're protected if they have those and in um, in uh, Thailand not so much in Sri Lanka they have these amulets which have a little bit of you know, um, some sort of relic in it, you know, so the ash from uh, some great monk or nun's funeral. And that's believed to be a protection. I mean, they even take it so far. Some people think that they're protected from bullets. <laughs> Amazing. Ajahn Shah, who's a great teacher, meditation master in Northeast Thailand, told him that's foolish. <laughs> that's not fo he wasn't in buying into that. And... By and large, there were no amulets made in his name, but I think in more recent days, they have made them. <laughs> of course, there's money in amulets. They're very, very expensive in Thailand. And of course, blessings from the Sangha. We give the blessing after the meal and, uh, and on other occasions. And um, that again, you know, the importance of that is not only the uh, understanding that's good, but the feeling that it arouses. Because a lot of these things generate very wholesome feelings, you know, of, of uh, faith. Uh, faith is this, uh, or confidence sometimes we call it, this really strong, this emotion which is very supportive for the practice. And uh, also the in Sri Lanka and uh, probably in Thailand too, the, the seeking of protection from devas. These are the heavenly beings that have got quite a lot of power. This is a common thing. And in Sri Lanka, we have many Devali, as they call them. And this is where people go to these Devalis, these uh, Deva shrines, and make offerings. And then they come with a big list <laughs> of what they want. <laughs> and they make a deal. If, if I get this, I will give that. <laughs> It's, it sounds a bit funny, but the, the Buddha actually said the devas do help us. And, you know, he says to, the, he mentions in the Ratna Sutta that human beings make offerings day and night. So the, the devas should protect human beings. So it is there, it is there. So I think that's a, a very important, uh, it, is, it is part of it. So that's the external, that's the external. But as I mentioned, the real practice, the real protection is our practice according to Dhamma. Uh, and this is, as I mentioned, what Venerable Dhammika is talking about when he says, truly practicing Dhamma according to the Dhamma protects the practitioner. Dhamma well practiced brings happiness. This is the reward when Dhamma, when well practiced, uh, reward of Dhamma when well practiced. The practitioner does not go to a bad destination. And recently I've been re I read a book, I hadn't read, I'd seen it for years, maybe you've seen it. It's a, a white book and it's called uh, The Gifts He Left Behind. The Gifts He Left Behind. Have you heard of that book? It's quite a, an old Dhamma book. It was the first, first version with this huge A4 size, but the one I had is a tiny version. It's very nice actually. And it's the teachings of uh, a monk from Thailand called Ajahn Dun. Atulo. Atulo is his Pali name, and Dun, of course, is his uh, Thai name. Thai name, and he he was a very interesting monk because he um, he was one of the first disciples ordained by Ajahn Mun. That's pretty good. And he wandered in the forests for twenty years, the jungles of Thailand, and encountered malaria and wild animals and saw some of his companion monks dying from malaria right in front of his eyes. He couldn't do anything because they're living in the jungles which no longer exist. <laughs> so, and then after that he was asked to take over a, like a city temple to live in a city. And he went to live there for, uh -huh, went to live there for 50 years he lived there actually. And uh, oh, 
technical difficulties. <laughs> I was going to quote from. I think it's downloading something at the moment. What is it doing? It's wonderful, isn't it? Technology is great. <laughs> it really, it really teaches you to let go. Actually, <laughs> I know, I know people get really frustrated when they. I think, just you know, I think they're great for patience for Kanti, Kanti, you know. So this this teacher, he was living in this city, uh, Syrian in Thailand, and. Um, that city had this big fire, and I'm not sure at the time, I think it's probably the 70s, and uh, a lot of houses burnt down, a lot of shops burnt down. It doesn't mention a lot of people were killed, but people were really uh, desperate, and some people, it said, lost their minds. And they all came to, not all of them, but many people came to uh, see this monk, uh, uh, Ajahn Dun, to complain. Complain. Their parents had been making merit since, you know, their parents, their grandparents had been making merit. And still, their houses burnt down. <laughs> and what good is the Dhamma? And, it's, and they say in this little introduction to his quote, because the collection of quotations and the stories about what uh, the situation that he's responding to. And so they were complaining to him. Some of them didn't come back to the temple. They thought, what's the point? My house will burn down again. <laughs> what good is it? So that's the sort of protection they thought. And he said to them, and this is a lovely quote, I think, the Dhamma doesn't help people in that way at all. The fire simply acted in line with its nature. Fire burns, destroys. What this means is that destruction, loss, disintegration, separation have always been a part have always been with us in, in this world. As for those who practice the Dhamma, who have the Dhamma in their hearts, when they meet... Oh, look at that, it's doing it again. Whew. Dear me, technical problems. <laughs> Halfway through it, I think I have to... Flight mode. That's it. We'll get back to that. Ah, we're getting there. So he says, As for those who practice the Dhamma, who have the Dhamma in their hearts, when they meet with these things, they understand how to place the mind in such a way that it doesn't suffer. That's how the Dhamma helps. It's not the case that it helps by preventing ageing or death or hunger or fire. That's not the case at all. So that's a good reminder, isn't it, for us. I think it puts it really, really beautifully because it's really the understanding we have in our hearts, the wisdom that we have in our hearts, the refuge that we have in our hearts, in our minds, in the Dhamma, that protects us. That's really what protects us. And all, all the Dhamma in that, uh, that book is really high Dhamma. It was obviously, you know, a very, very advanced uh, uh, practitioner. So this is is really really points to the to the to the fact that we have to practice dhamma, and sometimes people say to me, you know, they they we have the view. Some people have the view that, you know, the only way we really practice the dhamma is through meditation, but that's not true because we practice the dhamma, uh, we get the protection of dhamma when we do dana, when we give, not only to monks and nuns but to to whoever we encounter, and we also get protection from the sealer that we take if we keep it. <laughs> Only if we keep it. <laughs> that's the that's the that's the catch, isn't it? <laughs> so it's not only the meditation, you know, because sometimes people think like that. So in Sri Lanka and here too, I say even people who, people who are only practicing dana, they are practicing the dhamma, but they're not getting the full protection. Of course, you know that's only a very it's a it's a good protection in the sense that if we give to others, it's like the quality control in our this life and in future lives, because you know we have that saying in Christianity from Jesus: "Give and you shall receive." So. Whatever you give out, when you take it, say for instance, in a new life, you have a good quality in that life. 
It doesn't determine what sort of uh, realm of existence you'll go to. I mean, you could be born as a dog. But because of previous dana, great. You'll, be, you'll have all the best food. You know, you'll be looked after, heated kennel. <laughs> you know, all these things. And just recently I heard of some, uh, some people, I think, you know, I know people in Sri Lanka that are amazing with, their, with animals, you know, and even in here too. And these people, this dog had uh, cancer and uh, the owners just looked after it all the time. They were making, it couldn't eat. So they were making special food, blending it all up and making sort of these sort of largish pellets and putting it in the dog's mouth, playing the uh, the uh, teachings of the Buddha, period, uh, parita chanting, day and night for the dog, looking after the dog. They sent me a photo of the dog. It looked very happy, actually. I thought it didn't look too... It looked a bit, a bit shocked, I think, from the camera, but <laughs> it didn't look like it was on its last legs. But they looked after it incredibly. So this is giving, you know, and this giving will come back to us, actually. And that sort of giving is really, you know, most people would say, look, it's a stray dog, why bother, <laughs> you know. And uh, only the other day somebody told me, um, uh, at Dana actually, they told me that the, they'd bought a stray dog from uh, Sri Lanka, from Deer Talawa. Incredibly expensive, you know. A number of people chipped in $5,000 each for it to come here, you know. I th and I said, wow, that dog's got good parami, you know. So it's obviously done a lot of dana in a past life, that it's got this support. But dana, as I'm trying to, as I mentioned, doesn't determine where we were born, where we are reborn. So what does determine that is our sila, that's our conduct of body, speech and mind really. That really determines it, but dana, the quality control, so it's important. So we're practicing the teachings of the Buddha if we do dana for sure, and that makes us more generous. And uh, it, as I say, it reduces, it reduces also the, the sense of selfishness, what I need, what I want. We're thinking about somebody else for a change. <laughs> so it's very, very good in that sense. So it reduces that selfishness and goes against what the Buddha called the cause of suffering or the cause of unsatisfactoriness. Do people know what that is? Craving or tanha, they say, but it's wanting, it's just wanting. That's the cause of suffering. The Buddha mentions the main cause. Wanting things to be in a particular way or not to be in a particular way that they are now. This is the problem not being able to accept the present moment as it is, whether it's pleasant or not. And of course, as I mentioned, big protection is sila, you know, the morality, the ethical uh, behaviour. That's the main protection, actually. And also, it's very good for this life because then we have this sense of being a good person. We feel good about ourselves and we have less regrets, you know, as uh, about what we've done and said. And also, if... With sila and uh, um, developing the wholesome in this life, it means we're protected to some to a large degree, actually, because if we we have this saying in English, uh, good things happen to good people, bad things do too, but not as much. <laughs> I think somebody should put that down. The asterisk: bad things do too, but not as much. But what the the logic of that, from my from my understanding of the Buddha's teaching, is that. If we create a lot of good things for our speech, action, and the way we think, very, very important actually, then there's less opportunity for negative karma vipaka, negative karma from the past to come up. Why is that? Because the, the, for that to ripen, the conditions have to be right. It's like a, a plant. You have to have the right sort of soil or you've got to have the fertilizer and water and so forth. And it's the same for karma. So if we do a lot of good, there's less opportunity for that negative uh, karma from the past to ripen in this life. Of course, if it's very strong, that's an, it will come up sometime during this life. But of course, the biggest protection in Buddhism, what's the biggest protection in Buddhism? In Buddha, I think everybody's got their own ideas, but, but it is really the, the main protection. Hmm? Virtue. Virtue. Yeah, no, we just talked about virtue. I've moved on now. 
absolutely. Wisdom, yeah, that's it. That's when we understand how things are, we're really protected. We don't expect the world to be other than it is. And that gives us a big protection, actually. And the, one of the uh, important aspects of wisdom is right view. But uh, for me, just a really basic, I think I emphasise this one in my practice, it's a, big, a very important part of my practice, is just to know what is wholesome, what's positive, and what's unwholesome, what's negative in my actions, my speech and the way I think. Just to realise what state of mind I'm cultivating. Is it positive or negative? That sounds very simple, <laughs> but isn't far from simple actually. And the Venerable Sariputta, when he talks about right view, he emphasises that. And he emphasises that we know the wholesome, that's the positive, we know the unwholesome, that's the negative, and we know where they're coming from. You know, and he says, and the Buddha says, you know, it's coming from greed, hatred and delusion, the unwholesome, and the positive coming from non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion, you know. So this is a really important area and uh, I'm talking to the, uh, last night I had a uh, teens group, and we were talking about these unwholesome uh, roots of, uh, in the mind, you know, greed, hatred and delusion. Last night was greed and uh, using the quote, Greed is good. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> so that's very important. So that is a big protection if once you know, you know, that something's wholesome or uh, positive or it's unwholesome, it's negative. It's still not easy sometimes to let go of the negative, even when you recognise it. That's a, another talk. So... And the other things that protect us too, you know, in terms of understanding, understanding impermanence, nothing lasts, dukkha, which is uh, unsatisfactoriness or suffering, and anicca, uh, sorry, anatta or anatma in Sinhala, which is non-self, you know, not taking things personally, no owner of this body and mind. When we have that wisdom, it really relieves us of a lot of fear, a lot of insecurity. It protects us because we, we really understand the nature of reality. That's the only thing we are that causes fear and these defilements to come up is not understanding reality. And also we have to purify the mind, of course. But once we understand reality, then it's not so fearful. Then there, it's not, we don't have such insecurity you know, that everything is of the nature, that it can't last, that it won't satisfy permanently. Part, partly the reason that it can't satisfy permanently is because everything that's conditioned can't last. It changes all the time. And that's, we see that in our lives all, uh, a lot of the time. And uh, one of the biggest areas, of course, is relationships. So, you know, people st start out very much, often very much in love and, you know, this is forever and eternal. But sometime later, that's not the case. <laughs> and so we see, even there, there particularly, we see Anitya. You know, our feelings have changed, the other person's changed, we've changed. Um, so that relationship's not the same. And you see that. And uh, not only, one of the biggest, one of the biggest protections is being able to see that uh, anatta, non-self. I saw a lovely book when I was in Sri Lanka. I haven't read it. I saw the book title. I thought, oh, fantastic book title by Ajahn Samedo. It's called Don't Take Your Life Personally. Don't Take Your Life Personally. <laughs> That's anatta. Because <laughs> we think it's me and mine. And when the body is me and mine, there's a lot of fear. And, uh, and when the mind starts to do all sorts of tricks, then we can also suffer a lot too, you know. But when we realise it's not me or mine, it's not something I control, and that I control or own, uh, then it gives a lot of peace and a lot of understanding. It reduces fear and uh, reduces insecurity. It protects us. Just that understanding. Oh, just an, you know, for instance, with the body, as you get older, you know, there's all these things that come up, you know. And one of the big things that comes up for many people is cancer of different sorts. You know, but this is part of nature, part of the body. This is part of the wisdom of a nature, impermanence, that nothing lasts, it changes all the time, and unsatisfactoriness. And also very much non-self, isn't it? You know, 
It's not a personal thing. It's not just, you know, the common common reaction and the biggest suffering with any major illness is, why me? <laughs> and I like one person who had a terrible, you know, uh, bike accident on a push bike and got hit by a lorry. She said the big turning point for her in her recovery was saying, why not me? Why not me? I thought, fantastic. That's really spot on. So, of course, and the other thing that uh, is a great protection is, you know, in terms of the Buddha's teaching, Four Noble Truths, but that's part of the right view to Four Noble Truths, that we know um, the unsatisfactoriness, the suffering in life, we know the cause for it, which is wanting it to be other than it is, and then we know the way to uh, remove that or reduce that. Uh, to the cessation of that unsatisfactoriness. We have the path, the Noble Eightfold Path. So these things are a great protection. And one th I didn't mention, that, uh, and it came up um, when we were chanting, is, other, is taking refuge. If we're really in a difficult situation, you know, major operation coming up or some big turmoil in our lives, you know, just remembering the refuges, taking the refuges is a very good way to bring up a feeling of um, a peace, acceptance, security in, in the mind. Because we know, you know, these things, as Ayakima would say, we don't take refuge in things that are not the ultimate. And the ultimate is Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. This is the enlightened Sangha. And this is, you know, the Dhamma and the, the Buddha as an enlightened being. And so it really, at stressful times, times of crisis, this is very helpful just to do that. Because in those times, we really need emotional support. <laughs> we don't need, you know, someone, you know, sort of intellectually explaining things. What we need is that real sense of uh, something solid, something reliable, something dependable. And uh, that gives us security if we can uh, remember the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha. But I wasn't going to talk about this, actually. <laughs> I was mainly going to talk about protection through uh, meditation, uh, through bhavana, actually. Bhavana in the Buddhist teaching, as you often hear, hear and I say, always say in Sri Lanka, is not just in, in Sinhala, in the Sri Lankan language. Bhavana means meditation. But in Pali, bhavana means how we cultivate, how we develop our mind how we use it, the things we repeat again and again. And of course, you know, we can develop our minds in a positive sense or a negative sense. And as I've mentioned many times before, you can see people have developed negative states of mind to an incredible degree. The anger, the rage, you know, we see this road rage and everything. And if you read the news or see the news, um, you know, you can see many examples of this, you know, people who have developed negative states of mind. But the Buddha, the Buddha's teaching is all about developing positive states of mind, developing the wholesome and letting go of the negative. And this, he said, this leads to your happiness. Developing the negative states will lead to your unhappiness, lead to our unhappiness and problems for other people as well. So I always say to people, though, you know, the, the good thing with the Buddha's teaching is it's completely optional. <laughs> we have a choice. We can develop the negative if you wish, but we see the results of it. Hopefully people reflect on it, you know, um, that they're not getting much out of being very negative. In fact, they're harming themselves here and now and maybe others as well. And see the results of developing the positive, you know, if it makes us more happy. Uh, and it makes others around us more happy. It's more benefit to others as well. So one of the biggest protections, I think, uh, in uh, the, the Buddha's teaching, um, 10.30, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, one of the biggest uh, protections of the Buddha's teaching is loving kindness, isn't it? Metta or Maitri and Sinhala is a real, real, real protection. Because that loving kindness, that friendliness, that well-wishing, particularly for ourselves and others, is, is a great protection from negative states of mind. And even greed and things like that are lessened by metta. Because if you're wishing well for other people, for yourself and other people, it reduces that greedy sort of mind that's only thinking of, number one, <laughs> what I want, what I need, and what I've got to get. 
So uh, metta or maitri, I encourage that as a, a, as, some, as a form of meditation that will really help and support our lives and our meditation too. I came, uh, my, one of my teachers, famous uh, Buddhist nun, uh, who, who ordained in Sri Lanka, German Buddhist nun, and uh, she always recommended when whatever form of meditation we were doing, be it walking meditation, breath meditation, whatever, she said, just do you know, a few minutes of uh, loving kindness first because it conditions the mind, it reduces those negative qualities in the mind and clears the way for whatever form of meditation you're practicing. And not only that, it feels good. <laughs> I think that is a, you know, a very important aspect to it. And the Buddha often said, you know, the reason that he continued to meditate as an enlightened being, didn't need to, no point. He said it was a pleasant abiding point, it was enjoyable for him. And the second thing he said is a good example. <laughs> so anyone that says later on, as you hear even today, meditation's not necessary. You don't need meditation. You know, all you need to do is see things as they are. You can say, well, the Buddha, he used to meditate. <laughs> so this is a very good, uh, good reason for him meditating. But of course, there are other wholesome emotions that the Buddha encouraged. And these ones are like compassion, um, joy for others' successes, others' good qualities. This is mudita and upeka, contentment, gratitude. Their respect, that's a really good one too. It's not common in the West, actually. Respect is a very, uh, is not, not a common one. But of course, what's one that I missed? This is supposed to be the subject of the talk. <laughs> I'll just do a few minutes of it. It's, it's, a, it's a buzzword these days, the buzzword. Mindfulness, yeah, sati, you know, in Pali, sati, mindfulness is, is, the, uh, is a great protection. And this is what I was going to refer to, the suttas uh, where the Buddha talks about mindfulness protecting us. And I'm going to just mention one, this one, the simile of the acrobat. I think I've spoken about it before. Have you heard of that one? Yep, Frank has, that's good. And the, the, the Buddha, it shows how we can protect ourselves and others. In India, and at the time of the Buddha, they had these acrobats that worked in pairs. One was the, uh, like this, the, the, uh, the support or the base, and he had a big pole, or a long pole, which he either put here, on the, I think on the collarbone, or here on the forehead. That would be, be really amazing. And then this, this uh, like bamboo um, uh, pole, and then the assistant would climb up and do acrobatics on top of that pole. Amazing, isn't it? They still do it, evidently. I have, I've heard that that's still the case. And so one day there was a pair of them, and the, the person who was the, holding the pole, he's called the teacher. He was evidently the teacher. And his assistant, according to the Pali, it sounds like, was a, f a young girl or young woman, somebody light anyway, <laughs> I suspect. And uh, one day he said to her, uh, you protect me, dear Medica, uh, Medicatalica, and I'll protect you. And she, she surprisingly, this is surprising in the context of being his, her teacher, said, that's not the way to do it. Teacher, you protect yourself, teacher, and I'll protect myself. So she's saying, no, you look after yourself. I'll do my job, you do your job. And, and, and the Buddha, when he's, he's recounting this story, he's giving this story, he says, ah, that's the method there. That's the right method. <laughs> that's the right method. And he goes on to say, I will protect myself, monks. Thus should the establishments of mindfulness, this is Satipatthana, Satipatthana, establishments of mindfulness, be practiced. I will protect others, monks. Thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. And then he goes on, and then he summarizes. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. Sounds neat, doesn't it? It's a bit sort of, you know, very nice uh, sort of the way he expressed it. And very catchy. Didn't you say catchy? Yeah, catchy. And also it makes you think, 
what does he mean? <laughs> what does he mean? And he says, and how is it, monks, that by protecting oneself one protects others? By the pursuit, development and cultivation of the four establishments of mindfulness, satipatthana, that's how we... It is in such a way that by protecting oneself one protects others. And then he says, this is interesting, how is it, monks, that by protecting others one protects oneself? And then he says, by patience, harmlessness, loving kindness and sympathy in such a way, it is in such a way that by protecting others one protects oneself. And then he concludes by saying, I will protect myself, thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. I will protect others, monks, thus should the establishments of mindfulness be practiced. Protecting oneself, one protects others. Protecting others, one protects oneself. So that's very, very um, sort of interesting because he's saying, you know, when we are mindful, when we have the four establishments of mindfulness, and this is awareness of four areas, the body, the, the feeling, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, uh, the mind states, usually they're our reactions to our experience actually. Um, you know, like anger, if there's anger there, he says, you know there's anger in the mind. If it's not there, you know it's not there. If there is greed and and so forth, can can be non positive qualities too, you know, if, if the mind is coming together in meditation, you know that the mind is one-pointed. But it can be any of the emotions. So you know, we know what's going on in the mind. And then the last aspect of, of the four foundations of mindfulness is seeing our experience in terms of Dhamma. If we, if we contemplate Dhamma a lot, the Buddha's teaching, then when we start to experience things, we start to see it through the focus that the Buddha had, that he's recommending. And this is a very useful way for us to learn. So for instance, in Dhamma Nupassana, looking at our experience through the lens of Dhamma, we have things like the five hindrances uh, as, as a focus. You know, if there are negative aspects in the mind, we have an idea of how to deal with things like desire, with aversion, with sleepiness and drowsiness, with restlessness and agitation, restlessness and remorse, we say, or worry, and doubt. We know how to deal with them. And there's also the enlightenment factors, seven enlightenment factors. And this is looking at the positive side of meditation, how we develop, uh, talk about sati, mindfulness, developing the investigation, understanding of what we're experiencing, uh, the po whether it's positive or negative, and then energy coming up, and then this joy, this is the uh, uh, piti, or in Sinhala they say priti, uh, coming up, and then from that, this tranquility of the body and the mind, and then from that, the mind coming together, we say samadhi, Arjun Brahm says stillness, and then upeka, this ability to look at things in a very... Um, uh, like a detached way, but a very clear way. You know, the mind's very purified, so it's it's very clear. So this is how um, we can protect ourselves and we can protect others. When we know what's going on in this body and mind, it's pretty hard to harm ourselves or others, actually. But what is very interesting for me in that teaching, he says that we protect, protect others by patience, harmlessness, loving kindness and sympathy. So really what the Buddha is pointing, and he calls this mindfulness, satipatthana. He calls this part of satipatthana. It's not the usual understanding of satipatthana because usual understanding is just the present moment, what we're experiencing here and now. But of course, you know, another, another aspect of the meaning of sati is the ability to remember the Buddha's teaching, to remember the teaching, to remember any wise teachings. So these qualities we, we are using as the focus for our mindfulness. So when others are difficult, patience is very, very useful. This is kanti in Pali. You know, that being able to um, bear up, but not in a negative way. If there's a aversion in the mind, that's unwholesome. You know, it's more from understanding, maybe from uh, some metta or loving kindness. You realize this person, you know, they want happiness, but what the, what the, the way they're speaking or acting will only lead to their harm, you know. If we act and speak and think in a negative way, it will lead to our harm. 
So when you see someone who's losing it and you have to have kanti, you think, wow, poor, you know, you have compassion for them. You think, wow, they can, they can get the results of this. You know, it's not going to be good, <laughs> depending on how negative it is. And the same with harmlessness is the core part of the Buddha's teaching. Ahimsika is the actual, is really the essence of the Buddha's teaching. Not harming, not harming, uh, non-violence, not harming is the, is the core of ethical behaviour. And it's not harming ourselves or others. And the same with loving kindness is wishing well, being friendly, having this openness to ourselves. This is important actually, and then others. And lastly, this sympathy, they call it sympathy, but it's more, I think, more like empathy, you know. We can put ourselves in the place of other people. Uh, and that actually is very, very helpful because then we can say, oh my goodness, no wonder they're doing what they're doing. No wonder they're saying what they're saying. Because when we understand things as, you know, see, see things as they really are, this is seeing it too, as they really are then we can let go, we don't get upset, we don't take it personally. We realise this is just um, the way they are at this present moment. They won't always be like that, hopefully. <laughs> so these are the, this is the way that the uh, Satipatthana protects us. But as I mentioned, the whole of the Dhamma is about protecting us. And we protect ourselves by developing these positive qualities and reducing the negative qualities, the unwholesome qualities. And in so doing, we develop more happiness and we reduce the difficulties, the problems, uh, the sufferings in our lives. When we develop the wholesome and let go, reduce the unwholesome or negative aspects of our lives. So I'd like to finish there. So. And just to remind you that, uh, uh, that the, the verses that I chanted when I first uh, started the talk, if I can find them. Ah, here we are. Oh no, that's it. Truly practicing Dhamma according to the Dhamma protects the practitioner. Dhamma well practiced brings happiness. This is the reward of Dhamma when well practiced. The practitioner of Dhamma does not go to a bad destination. So I'd like to finish there and encourage all of us, myself included, to practice the Dhamma as well as we can, you know, and see the results and the benefits of it. And then, you know, then our refuge becomes stronger, our faith, our confidence becomes stronger. We be the mind becomes steadier, more balanced, more able to see what's really going on in our lives and other people's lives. So I'd like to finish there. So sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, if there are any questions, we can have quickly have. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions. Any questions? Oh. No, no. There's an online question. Is it from Sri Lanka? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> That's probably the question. That's, that's the question I hear when people answer their mobile, mobile telephone anywhere in the world. The question people are, where are you? <laughs> that's what I hear people say. Oh. Yes. Ajahn, we have one online question. Yes, thank you. From Beeble Brox. How do you protect yourself, from, protect yourself and others from self-condemnation for a blind mistake made? but is long in the past and gone. Gone, yes. Well, in that case, you know, the way we, we protect ourselves is, of course, to a certain extent, the wisdom that understands the person that I was then, I'm not that person now. Things have changed. So this is a Nietzsche, you know, that nothing lasts, nothing is permanent. So anybody that has a committed a terrible crime, you know, they've killed somebody or whatever, they did that, but they won't always be a killer. They have done an unwholesome action in the past. We tend, with the language we use, you know, it tends to solidify people as being always like that. And the same to this person. You, you are not that person that committed that, did something that you didn't approve of. I don't know what it would be. So that's the first thing our wisdom understands. We've changed, you know, this is a Nietzsche. And also that it's not self. 
too, you know, anatta. That what I did then, what I said then, what I thought then was due to causes and conditions at that time uh, that were uh, happening at that time. So then I did that. Some of the conditioning at that time, I did that action or I said that or I th used to think like that. So that now those conditions can change. So this is the, uh, the importance of wisdom, understanding anicca, dukkha and anatta. But the, that is good for the understanding at an intellectual level and that may help let go but the very important thing is uh, metta, loving kindness, to have that for oneself, to have compassion for oneself. You know, compassion is, is probably the, the, the right one in this case. You know, compassion sees that, yeah, we all make mistakes. Um, we see that other people make mistakes and we're willing to, to forgive those uh, mistakes that we've made. Um, uh, because I think a very good contemplation, you know, in terms of uh, lack of ability to forgive ourselves is to say, am I perfect? <laughs> am I perfect? And of course, you know, we, we, we realise, no, no, I'm not perfect. So therefore, so we extend that to other people. We don't expect them to be perfect either. So this is very helpful if this person can develop compassion and use maybe that reflection too, am, am I perfect? But to have this uh, well-wishing for oneself is very, very important, you know, to forgive oneself, to be one's best friend, to, to understand we're not perfect, um, and to accept, you know, that we, we have, uh, you know, we make mistakes in the past and, and now too, you know. So, and that, that's the sort of the emotional and the intellectual level to that that I, I think is useful, useful. So I hope that uh, answers the question. Fortunately, he's not, not here to say, no, no, yeah. that's not it at all. She says, <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you. by a mile. Thank you. Last question. Ajahn, you mentioned about... Um, one thing about being taught by Ajahn Chah that is how to protect yourself from ghosts and should, you, should we fear ghosts? Yes, uh, he, he used a technique that the Buddha used uh, for fear and um, uh, insecurity which is confronting it, you know, confronting it. Because we have in the, um, the Bayabera Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, where the Buddha, this is when he wasn't a Buddha actually, he was a Bodhisattva, he wasn't enlightened yet. But he went to practice in the forest and he noticed that fear, we call it fear and dread they say, fear and dread came up in various situations. You hear a, a noise in the forest and think, oh, something's coming for me. And, and being the Bodhisattva, having a, enormous qualities already, you know, he, he decided the best approach was that if the fear came while he was walking, he would continue walking. But he wouldn't sit down, he wouldn't lay down, um, he wouldn't just stand. He would continue whatever activity he was doing until the fear passed. And the same with if he was sitting, you know, in meditation, a fear came, he'd stay sitting, which is more difficult. Because <laughs> if you're walking, you, maybe you can run away from it. <laughs> And same with standing. If the fear came when he was standing, he would stay standing until it had passed. By doing that, of course, what does he do? He confronts it. He sees it for what it is. He sees it arise and he sees it pass away. He sees that it, it isn't in control that way. And uh, so this is how the Bodhisattva developed. This is how the Buddha-to-be developed that ability to deal with fear and, and insecurity, to really see it for what it is, you know. And obviously having an understanding of non-self already, it's not a personal thing, and investigating it, seeing where it's coming from, why is it rising and why is it passing away. And the same for Ajahn Chah, because he had this terrible fear, <laughs> fear of ghosts. So what do you do if you've got a terrible fear of ghosts? What's the worst place to go? Graveyard, yeah, so he did. And, you know, he went to, I don't know if they actually had body. they did, they had bodies there, you know, some, they burned them in the open or, you know, if, they, if nobody, um, uh, no, if there was no family or friends or it was some sort of criminal type, I think it just left the body to rot, you know, in the open. So he, he set up his, his mosquito net and, and would practice 
in these places. Now, it's easy during the day, but when the night would come, you know, he was just, it was so terrifying for him. And he'd hear these sounds, you know, and hear these sounds coming closer and closer. He'd be absolutely petrified. And I think one stage he opens his eyes and he says, oh, it's a dog. <laughs> Because when human flesh burns, it's like any flesh, isn't it? Like any meat. It smells like a barbecue. And so the dogs are coming for food, you know. So, But the, he, he, had, he stayed the whole night. I think he spent quite a bit of time there. But he was so petrified that he wouldn't move. He couldn't even get up to go to the toilet. And uh, he was so petrified. But he, uh, by doing that, he broke through that fear. Uh, he confronted it, he understood it, and was able to let go of it, and, and never uh, never frightened of ghosts after that. Because a lot of the, the um, fear of ghosts is really, uh, it's the fear that comes up in us, really. It makes us do things that are harmful for ourselves, harmful to ourselves and others, actually. Uh, this is what uh, Ajahn Brahm says, ghosts only have the ability to make us afraid. <laughs> That's all they do. So that's what he says. Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. So confronting it. That's the way. But most of us, you know, we don't go that. We don't. We don't last the distance. So we have a fear come up, don't we? And then we just sort of, you know, do something else. You know, turn the TV on. You know, go for a walk. You know, whatever. Call somebody on the phone. Watch a dumber video. <laughs> do some chanting or whatever, we don't see the whole of the fear arise and pass away. We don't develop the wisdom that sees it for what it is as an impermanent mind state that can't last, that's only there to make us afraid. And you know, people who really understand fear, is they realise that the fear is just making, the, the fear, it's the fear of fear really, that's it. It's the fear of fear. It's like a, a bogeyman really, the reality is, is just a mind state, yeah. But a very compelling mind state. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Arjun. Just to follow up on that, um, from an evolutionary biology perspective, yeah. fear is instilled in us so that we can survive longer, in, in a sense. Yes. Yeah. So am I right, right to say that um, sometimes it's not necessarily just about challenging fear, but rather to be mindful mm. of why we, are, we have that fear and whether it's productive for us Mm. Because obviously, you know, a long time ago what, when we were in nature and we hear a sound, we might think that that could be a snake or it could be a predator. Mm. Yeah. Whereas in, you know, in no normal everyday life, that yeah. still is within us, but we don't have that sort of, we, if we're in a park mm. and we hear something, it's not going to be a snake. No. You know, chances are. Yeah. No, no, that's very true, you know, and the... the uh, in, it, there's lots of ways to deal with fear, you know, um, and as I mentioned, you know, this is one way that the Buddha, the, uh, the Buddha to be used and Ajahn Chah used. And it takes a lot of courage to be like that, actually. But mindfulness is, is very important. And, and of course, our understanding of, you know, why the fear is coming up. And as you say, you know, it's part of um, protection system. Uh, what do they call it? Flight and fright, isn't it? Flight and fright, yeah. Fight, flight, or freeze. Yeah, right. Fight, flight. Well, that must be a new, new adaption. So, no, that's very good. Thank you. Yeah, that's very good. So now maybe we can uh, end uh, the um, the program this morning, and you're welcome to come over for dana, the program for the for the stomach, for the tummy. <laughs> so now, now those who wish, we can pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha. <laughs>